Welcome, fellow crime enthusiasts, to Claws and Crime Chronicles. Today, we're diving into the gripping tale of Ruth Ellis, a femme fatale with claws of justice and a trigger-happy heart. Step into the shadows of jealousy and passion as we unravel the shocking story of a woman whose love led to a deadly crime of passion. So get ready to sharpen your detective claws as we journey through the gripping saga of Ruth Ellis, a name forever etched in the annals of true crime history. Subscribe now and let the pursuit of justice begin. Ruth Ellis, née Nielsen, was the last woman to be executed in the United Kingdom. She was executed by hanging at Holloway Prison in London by Albert Pierre Point after being found guilty of killing her lover, David Blakely. The third of six children, Ruth was born on October 9, 1926, in the Welsh beach town of Rill. Her family had relocated to Basingstoke when she was a little girl. Her mother, Bertha Cothels, was a refugee from Belgium. Her father, Manchester-born cellist Arthur Hornby, spent a lot of his time performing on cruise ships in the Atlantic. After the birth of Ruth's older sister Muriel, Arthur changed his last name to Nielsen. Due to her abusive father, Ruth temporarily attended Fairfield Senior Girls' School in Basingstoke before leaving home at the age of 14. Then, in Reading, Berkshire, she worked as an usherette at a movie theater. Soon after, in 1941, during the height of the Blitz, Arthur accepted a live-in work as a caretaker chauffeur for the lift maker, Porn and Dunwoody Limited. The following year, while Ruth's older brother Julian was on leave from the Royal Navy, she became friends with Edna Turvey, who gave her a taste of what was then known as the fast life. Eventually, Ruth and Edna settled in London and stayed with Ruth's father. He carried on abusing Ruth while having an affair with Edna, which was discovered in bed by Bertha when she paid an unexpected visit. Soon after, Bertha herself relocated to London. Ruth, a 17-year-old, had a son named Claire Andrea Nielsen, often known as Andy, in 1944 after becoming pregnant from a married Canadian soldier named Claire. For approximately a year, the father supplied money, then stopped. The youngster finally moved in with Ellis's mother. By the end of the 1940s, Ruth had worked as a nudist model and was earning far more money as a nightclub hostess than she had from the several manufacturing and office jobs she had worked since leaving school. She worked at the Duke Street Court Club, where Morris Conley, the manager, coerced his hostess staff into sleeping with him. Having started prostitution, she became pregnant by one of her regular clients in the beginning of 1950. In the third month, she had this pregnancy ended, illegally, and went back to work as soon as she could. She married 41-year-old George Ellis, a divorced dentist with two sons, on November 8, 1950 at the Tonbridge Kent Registration Office. He had patronized the court club. The marriage quickly broke down because he became angry, drunken, possessive, and jealous that she might be having an affair. Ruth often left him but always came back. Ruth made an uncredited appearance as a beauty queen in the rank movie Lady Godiva Rides Again in 1951 while she was four months pregnant. Ruth became good friends with Diana Doors, who played Dennis Price in the movie Dana Winter, and Ruth. She then gave birth to a daughter named Georgina. However, George refused to claim paternity, and the couple soon fell out of love. Ruth and her daughter moved home with her parents, and in order to make ends meet, she resumed her hostessing career. Ruth Ellis was hired as the Little Club's manager in 1953. She was receiving rich presents from fans at the time, and she had a lot of famous friends. The Little Club was a well-known club within the motor racing community, and it was there that she met David Drummond Moffat Blakely, a 25-year-old who was three years younger than her and working on a racing car with his friends, the Findlaters. They met through racing driver Mike Hawthorne, Blakely was a polite former student of a public school who was also a competitive racer. Despite being engaged to Mary Dawson, another lady, he moved into Ruth's apartment above the club within weeks. They had an intense and turbulent relationship that occasionally resulted in physical violence. 
He hit her in the stomach during one of these fights in January 1955, which led to her miscarrying. David was known to be a heavy drinker and was jealous of Ruth's flirting with other club members, as she was of his other relationships. After that, she started dating Desmond Cusson. He was born in Surrey in 1921, served as an RAF pilot flying Lancaster bombers during World War II, and left the service in 1946 to pursue a career in accounting. He was made a director of the family-run wholesale and retail tobacconists Cussons & Company, which has locations in South Wales and London. Ruth moved in with Cusson at 20 Goodward Court, Devonshire Street, north of Oxford Street, after being fired as the Carroll Club's manager, and she later took on the role of his mistress. But when Ellis and Blakely continued to see other people, their relationship with each other grew more hostile and aggressive. Ellis accepted Blakely's proposal to wed her, but she miscarried in January 1955 as a result of a hit to the stomach she received from Blakely during an argument. As was previously noted, David was working on a racing car with Aunt Findlater over the Easter holiday in 1955, and despite Ruth's frequent visits and phone calls to the Findlater's house, David persistently refused to see her. Sadly, they had hired a nanny who Ruth thought David was having an affair with, even though he wasn't. So, on Easter Sunday afternoon, April 10th, 1955, Ruth convinced Desmond to take her to Hampstead, where she waited for David outside the Magdala Tavern in South Hill Park, where he and Findlater were having a drink. David Blakely and his friend Clive Gunnell exited at 9.30 p.m. When Blakely exited Henshaw's doorway, a newsstand close to the Magdala, Ellis was waiting on the sidewalk. She greeted, Hello, David, and he didn't respond until she yelled, David! Ellis pulled a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson Victory model handgun out of her handbag and fired five rounds at Blakely while he was looking for his car keys. Ruth chased him around the car after the first shot went wide, and as he began to flee, she fired a second shot, which caused him to fall to the ground. Witnesses described hearing several distinct clicks as Ruth attempted to fire the revolver's sixth and last shot before ultimately firing into the ground. Ruth was also seen to be standing entranced over the body. Gladys Kensington Yule, 53, was heading up to the pub with her husband when this bullet ricocheted off the road and struck her in the base of her thumb. Her husband had seen the murder from 20 yards away. She was promptly taken into custody by Alan Thompson, an off-duty police officer, who heard her say, I am guilty, I'm a little confused, as he removed the still-smoking revolver from her and placed it in his coat pocket. She was brought to the Hampstead police station, where she appeared calm and wasn't visibly intoxicated. She confessed fully to the police, after which she was accused of murder. With multiple bullet wounds to the intestines, liver, lung, aorta, and windpipe, Blakely's body was transported to the hospital. There was no lawyer present when Ruth was questioned or when her statement was recorded at the Hampstead police station, but three police officers were there that evening at 11.30 p.m. Detective Inspector Gill, Detective Inspector Crawford, and Detective Chief Inspector Davies. When Ruth initially appeared in front of the magistrates on April 11, 1955, she was still imprisoned in remand and lacked legal counsel. She underwent two examinations by the main medical officer, Mr. Penry Williams, who found no signs of a mental disorder. On May 3rd, she also underwent an electroencephalography examination, which revealed no abnormalities. She was examined by psychiatrists Dr. D. Whitaker for the defense and Dr. A. Dalzell for the home office while she was being held on remand in Holloway. Neither discovered signs of insanity, Ellis made his appearance before Mr. Justice Havers in the number one court at the Old Bailey in London on Monday, June 20th, 1955. She had just bleached and styled her blonde hair, and she was wearing a black suit and a white silk blouse. Her attorneys had advised her to downplay her appearance, but she was adamant about having her say. Many people in the courtroom believed that her obsession with looking like the brassy blonde was at least largely to blame for the negative impression she gave when delivering testimony. It's obvious when I shot him, I intended to kill him. This was her response to the one and only question Christmas Humphreys, the prosecutor's attorney, posed to her. 
When you fired the revolver at close range into David Blakely's body, what did you intend to do? Ruth would have been informed of this potential inquiry by the defense attorney, Aubrey Melford Stevenson, who was assisted by Seabag Shaw and Peter Rawlinson, before the trial started, because it is customary to do so. Her answer to Humphrey's open court query ensured a guilty judgment and the ensuing required death sentence. It took the jury 14 minutes to find her guilty. She was given the punishment and transported to Holloway's condemned cell. Ruth made a statement to Victor Mishkan, a lawyer whose firm had previously represented her in her divorce proceedings but not in the murder trial, at noon on July 12, 1955, the day before she was put to death. She had already fired Bickford, the attorney chosen for her by her friend Desmond Cussins. She offered more information regarding the incident and claimed that Cussins had given her the gun and driven her to the crime scene. Mishkan and Simmons proceeded to the home office after their 90-minute interview in the condemned cell to speak with a senior employee there about Ruth's findings. There was no relief, and the authorities made no attempt to investigate further. She wrote, I have always loved your son, and I shall die still loving him, in her last letter to David Blakely's parents from her jail cell. On Wednesday, July 13th, at exactly 9 a.m., Ruth was led 15 feet to the execution chamber next door by the official hangman, Albert Pierrepoint, and his helper, Royston Rickard. The drop was set at 8 feet 4 inches because she had been 103 pounds the day before. In barely 12 seconds, Pierrepoint carried out the execution, and her body was left to hang for an hour. The pathologist Dr. Keith Simpson's autopsy report on her was made public. That morning, almost a thousand people, including mothers with strollers, were gathered outside the prison, some of them silently praying for her. The execution notice was displayed outside the gates at 9.18 a.m., and the crowd dispersed shortly after that. Berta Nielsen, Ruth's mother, was discovered unconscious in a room filled with gas in her Hemel Hempstead apartment in 1969. She never entirely recovered, and she never again spoke clearly. George Ellis, Ruth's husband, succumbed to alcoholism and killed himself in 1958. In 1982, her son Andy, who was 10 years old when his mother was hanged, committed himself in a bedsit after suffering irreversible psychological harm. Andy received yearly payments for his upkeep from the trial judge, Sir Cecil Havers, and his funeral was covered by the prosecution's attorney at Ruth's trial, Christmas Humphreys. Georgina Ellis, who was three years old when her mother was put to death, was adopted after her father committed himself by hanging himself three years later. She was 50 when she passed away from cancer. Did Ruth deserve to be hanged? This is a very individualized matter, and it is never wise to draw conclusions about a situation from an earlier, very different era. The time had polarized opinion. However, given the information provided to them and the legal framework in place in 1955, the jury was forced to find Ruth guilty of murder. In the end, it was a premeditated murder that did not fall within the legal definition of provocation because it was not committed in the heat of the moment. At the time, the required death penalty for murder convictions left the court with no leeway. She was evaluated, like all convicted prisoners, by a group of home office doctors who determined that she was legally sane, that is, she did not have any mental disease that could be shown to have existed at the time, and that would have been serious enough to lessen her responsibility for the crime. Thanks for joining us on this wild ride through the tumultuous life of Ruth Ellis. We hope you clawed onto every detail of this captivating true crime story. Remember, the past may be long gone, but the lessons we learn from these chronicles are timeless. If you want more intriguing tales of crime and passion, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and join us on our next Pursuit of Justice. Until then, keep your claws sharp and your curiosity piqued. There are countless mysteries waiting to be uncovered. Stay curious, crime solvers. See you next time on Claws and Crime Chronicles.